Welcome everybody to my presentation. This is a, a, a slide presentation about a group of Florida artists on whom I based my uh, master's thesis. And I did a lot of research before I wrote the thesis and while I was writing the thesis. And I put a lot of it into these slides. And in between the slides, I will also talk about how I got started, who I met, and actually what really drew me to these high women. Sometimes when you hear the word high women, you think of the song, the group, but it's not that. These are 26 African-American artists who lived in and around the Fort Pierce area in the, uh, in the 1950s. And a lot of, they all knew one another or word spread once they started to paint, word spread. And uh, they, they were mostly untutored and untrained artists. Let me go back to my notes here so I can make sure I tell you everything. First of all, before we even start, I wanna show you this picture. I don't know if you can see this. If any of you have ever seen a picture like this with the um, palm trees, the sunsets and so forth, Usually there are also birds in the painting, but these are high women paintings, if you see anything like this. Elizabeth, and if you, if you do happen to see something like this, what, Amy? We're, we're, we're not getting the screen painting across generations, the legacy of the high women. So what yeah, we're seeing yeah. now is just you holding up a frame. Right, but, right, because I don't have this in the presentation. So I'm just showing this as an introductory sort of a thing. So we'll put that aside. Okay, let's go to the next one. And again, this is what I'm telling you about the 26 African-American artists, 14 of which are deceased now. The latest ones just died last year. And I'll talk about each one of these uh, points here. As I said, they lived in and around Fort Pierce. And if any of you near or know anything about Fort Pierce, you might know that the um, Florida landscape artist, um, Beanie Bacchus, has uh, lived there and is a renowned landscape artist. And because of his um, landscapes of Florida, there is a museum there, if anybody's interested, and they have not only um, Mr. Bacchus's landscapes, but they also have some of the high women's landscapes also. And only two of the high women, Alfred Hare and Harold Newton, were not exactly trained, but a Harold Newton especially, at the time he was, he was doing paintings on, religious paintings on black velvet. And when he met Mr. Bacchus, uh, Mr. Bacchus said, don't do that anymore. Don't do that anymore here. I'm going to show you this is the kind of thing that you could be doing because you understand Florida, you live in Florida, and let me show you a few techniques. So uh, Harold Newton went with it and he, uh, he produced, of all the 26 artists, he produced the most stunning landscapes. I mean, that's my personal opinion, but his, his landscapes are, to me, the most stunning. And not as good as Mr. Bacchus, but, of the high women, Mr. Newton is the best. So these guys, this is how they got their name. They traveled on the highways and they sold their work from the trunks of their cars, still wet in some instances, and uh, to banks, offices, hotels, and so forth. And they were relatively inexpensive, $25. If you were a tourist in Florida and you were going back home via uh, Route 1, uh, you were likely to see these guys alongside the road with their trunks open. And you would, go, you would go and say, hey, you know, I want a memory of this Florida, Florida landscapes. And uh, you would take one home with you. So I, we don't know how many they have ever produced, but it, some people have estimated that among the, the 26 of them, that there's probably 10,000 highwaymen paintings oh. in America. <laughs> now, this is a Mr. Bacchus's painting. He is renowned, as I said, beautiful painting. And you notice in his paintings, and this goes for the highwaymen also, there's a lot of sky. Two thirds of the picture is sky. There are always 
uh, palm trees, or in this case, these are, sl these are slash pines. And this looks, and there's rain. You can see the rain there in the, in the distance. And this looks more like the Everglades actually than anything else. Mm -hmm. And as I said, uh, Mr. Backus brought these two guys along, except for uh, Alfred Hare was one of those young guys who he said, you know, I, li I like this and I like the idea of selling my paintings, but I wanna do it faster. And as we go into the presentation, you'll see how different his paintings are. This particular painting of Mr. Backus is, is called Rainstorm. And our next one here, this is a Harold Newton. Now you can see he took Mr. Backus's uh, technique trips to heart. He really did learn. You see it's more than two thirds <coughs> sky. It's like four fifths of sky here. But he added the birds and he has a reflection in the, in the water. So as I said, I think uh, Mr. Newton's paintings are um, the best of the 26 guys. Let me see what else I say here. Oh, the uh, definitive book on the highwaymen is a book by Gary Monroe that came out in uh, 2001. And um, I will show you, this is what it looks like. It's called The Highwaymen, Florida's African-American Landscape Painters. The best part about this book is all the color plates. Lots of color plates in it. So if anybody's interested in, in going further with this, I recommend that book highly. Now this painting of uh, Newton's is called Glade Sunset. <laughs> and it shows just what um, we're talking about and what Bacchus wanted everyone to learn. So here's our next one. This is Alfred Hare. And as I said, he wanted to just get done. He wanted to get done, get the paintings in the trunk of the car and get out there to the highway. He didn't want to spend much time on these. And you can see that they're very quickly, very quickly realized. No, I like them. Pardon me? I like them. <laughs> oh, well, everybody likes them because they are the highwaymen. And they are, uh, I want you to notice something too. The, the one on the right, the lower one, if you notice the crown molding, since these guys were not rich, they did not paint on canvas. Canvas was much too expensive. They painted on, it was called Upson board, which um, I don't know how to describe it. It's kind of a, um, a tan colored board. Um, there's another name for it too. I'll come up with it eventually. And then what they did is they painted the painting, then they framed it with crown molding and they brushed some gold paint onto the frames to make it look a little special. And this painting, this one on the lower right here, it's one of the, one of the five that I uh, borrowed when I was defending my thesis. I borrowed five paintings from a woman in the nursing college. She was a collector and she lent me the painting so that I could defend my, my thesis. My thesis actually, I should tell you this, my thesis was not on the highwaymen themselves. My thesis was on the children of the highwaymen. That's why the title of it is called Painting Across Generations. I was interested in these paintings, but I was even more interested in whether the painting and art followed in the next generation. And more on that later. Oh, I have to mention that later too, okay. There was a resurgence of interest in these guys because um, they were given the name Highwaymen by a newspaper columnist in the mid 1990s. He was trying to describe what their art was all about, looking for a collective noun, I guess, uh, for all of them. And he picked Highwaymen because of the fact that they sold their paintings on the highway. And of course the interest intensified with Gary Monroe's book. And Gary Monroe very nicely and graciously was part of my committee, my thesis committee. And, um, uh, helped me get my degree. And the children's works uh, fuel interest also because they were um, establishing themselves as painters. And the current paintings, of course, uh, command higher prices. 
today. Or of course, the older paintings in the 50s and 60s. If you can get, if you could find one that's uh, framed in crown molding on Upson board, you've got a treasure there for sure. So the, the high women children that I was able to get in touch with was, um, there was a young man who lives up in uh, the Fort Pierce area, Roy McClendon Jr. Uh, I have interviewed him and Kelvin Hare, who is Alfred Hare's son, I interviewed him and Renee Mills, who is the daughter of Mary Ann Carroll. She was the only female highwayman. Oh, and an uh, interesting story here is that she, uh, during the 1950s, when she saw what her friends were doing with their um, paintings, what they did is they would gather in somebody's backyard and they would mount the Epson board. And the person who could do the sky or in the clouds would do that. And then the person that could do the palm trees would do that. Person who did best with birds would do that. So it was like assembly line painting. And when she saw what this was, go, how this was going on, she wanted to join. She wanted, she wasn't an artist herself, but she wanted to learn. And so she started painting with them. And her, her great love was the poinciana tree. So she would have these beautiful poinciana trees in her paintings. And the, one of the reasons they allowed her to join and learn was because she was the only one who had a working car. So she would have the car that they could put their paintings in and take out to the highway. So welcome, Mary Ann. Can we use your car? <laughs> so that's how she got involved. And another little story about her. She was invited to be a guest of honor at the White House in 2011. And she gave uh, Michelle Obama a painting of a poinciana tree. So there you go. Okay, let's go on. Whoops. So here's the next generation. I wasn't able to find everybody that I wanted to find. But of these people that I mentioned, um, they really helped me a lot in describing their parents' time as, a, as an artist. And some of their parents were still living, of course, some not. And they are not, ex they are not I would say, exactly like their parents because, because their parents were able to sell these paintings and quit working factory jobs, quit working the orange groves. These children all went to college. The children all established themselves as whatever they wanted to be, teachers, lawyers, doctors, whatever. And also they, they can, um, those of them that have galleries and Kelvin Herod has a gallery up in Fort Pierce and uh, Marianne, Carroll's Marianne Carroll's daughter has a gallery in Sanford. Uh, they were able to do what they wanted to do. They didn't have to do uh, factory work. They didn't have to work hard. So their paintings really don't mm, uh, really don't contain that desperation, if you want, might want to say, because they could take their time with it. And they also other they had education, so they could do whatever they wanted. But they do paint because they paint to pay tribute. They paint because it's profitable, and they paint to, to fulfill a desire. So the one other person that one person I really wanted to uh, interview was um, Harold Newton's daughter. Her name is Sherry Newton, and she lives down in Fort Lauderdale. I tried to get in touch with her, but she wouldn't. She wouldn't want to be interviewed. Um, Roy McClendon Jr., as I said, have, is up in um, Fort Pierce. He let me sit in his studio and watch him paint as uh, as I interviewed him, which was very nice. And um, uh, mm, what's the other guy? Okay, there was some um, up in Cocoa Beach, um, another artist. I, I wasn't able to interview him, but I interviewed one of his students in his gallery. So it was very interesting for me to go around that part of Florida and, and find these people and, and try to talk to them. So as I said, Sherry uh, Newton, her name is Sherry Newton Lumpkins now, she, uh, would not let me interview her, but I did find some of her paintings, which you'll see next. This is Harold Newton on the right. 
and Sherry there. Now, I, I don't exactly think that's the best painting in the world, but because the highwayman mystique is profitable, she is making some money on it. And who can blame her, really? As I said, Harold Newton was my favorite highwayman painter. He's probably the best of the lot. She paints in a tribute style. Now, the, uh, Harold Newton is one of three brothers. He had a brother Lemuel and a brother Sam. Lemuel has also passed away. Harold Newton died in the mid 1990s. He died before uh, the, the, the name was coined even. He had cancer and he died then. But Sam Newton has a, um, a, a studio up in um, Coco. I visited his studio, but of course he, he, uh, he would not let me interview him either. He is a, he's a very good painter. He is next to his brother, Harold, probably one of, the, one of the best of the highwaymen also. But his paintings go for the thousands of dollars. I'll tell you a little bit more about Sam Newton when we get towards the end of this presentation. So next we have, as I said, I interviewed Calvin Hare. He is the son of Alfred Hare, who was the very quick painter. And uh, he adapted his father's style of very quick windblown type things uh, because it's important to get it out there so you can sell it. I met him at a, um, uh, a gallery in Lake Worth on, um, I think it was Lucerne Avenue. It's a gallery called Art International. And this, this is what precipitated, well, actually, it's one of the things that precipitated my interest in, in this whole thing. As I was talking to him and uh, picking up this signed um, postcard, he was telling me that he didn't know his father because his father was, um, I think 26 and he was shot dead in a bar when he was about 28, something like that. So Kelvin really didn't know his father well at all, but he uh, carries on the legacy because he not only displays his own paintings, he displays the paintings of other, the other living highwaymen artists. So he is carrying on the legacy. And that's why he, I, I thought to myself, oh, sounds like that could be a topic of a thesis. The late carrying on the legacy. Here we go. So this is what uh, helped me uh, settle on my topic. He's a, he does have, as I say, a gallery in uh, Fort Pierce. He's also has a career as a city fireman. So he, and he displays others, others work. And here we go. The next one here. This is Roy McClendon Jr. This is the young man that I I sat with in his studio as he was painting. His paintings are a little different and um, kind of interesting, but really don't have that much of a, what I would consider a high women quality. The painting I showed you earlier, this one, that's his father. That's Roy McClendon, who is one of the 26 high women. So he makes a pretty good, um, the junior makes a pretty good living. He's also a, um, a minister and uh, he used to accompany his father to um, A.E. Bacchus's uh, studio in Fort Pierce. He also was put to work as a young, really young little kid in making the crown molding framing for the paintings. So he was involved from the very beginning. So it's very interesting to, to listen to him talk. Okay, we're almost at the end here. I wanted to show you something first before I say anything else. Okay, this is the picture I showed you earlier. Have you noticed the pink clouds? Yeah. Okay. This is a painting by um, George Buckner, who's uh, since deceased. Anyway, when I was uh, sort of like um, mulling over a topic for my master's thesis, um, I had met Calvin Hare. I talked to him. And then there was an article in our Palm Beach Post about uh, the passing of George Buckner. And it was an article about how, how, what he loved about the painting. He loved to make pink clouds. And so in most of his paintings, you'll see pink clouds. And so I thought, oh, wow, that's really cool. And they had, inter 
for this article about him, they had interviewed his son and his son was saying that uh, whenever they would be driving along um, in Florida, of course, uh, his father would say, pull over, pull over. They would pull over because there was this, this would be the kind of sunset or the kind of cloud configuration that his father loved to see. And most of the time was the pink clouds. So you put those two things together, and do a little research, come up with a book by Gary Monroe. And I had my, and do the interviews and so forth. And I had my, I had my topic. So um, now I'm gonna tell you about this. Uh, I got my, got my master's degree, obviously. And then of course my interest in the high women is still there. But I, uh, and I go to galleries and whenever their, paint, their paintings are displayed, I've met several of them. I have autographs from about 10 of them um, who autographed my Gary Monroe book. And uh, whenever I see that there's a, a, a display, an exhibition somewhere, I'll go and, 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 and see it. So one day, one day I was in a Goodwill and in the back and uh, donating some things from my house. And as I was waiting for them to give me a receipt, I looked uh, to my right and I saw this painting leaning up against the wall. And I could see from the back, because I knew this about the paintings, I can see from the back of the painting that it was ups and board. I could see that the, that the framing was crown molding. And so I said to them, and I looked and I, I couldn't see the, the front of it, obviously, but I could see that it looked like uh, it looked like ocean. So I said to the young man there, um, are you going to, is that painting going out on the floor? And he says, yeah, yeah, we just haven't gotten around to it. And I said, well, what, what do you, what, what kind of a price are you going to put on that? And he said, $9.99. I said, you mean $9.99? And he said, yeah. And I said, could I buy that now? And he said, sure, I'll take it out front for you. This painting is an original highwayman painting by Sam Newton. You can see, if you look to your right, I mean, on the screen here, if you look to the right hand side, you can see a little bit of tan there. That's the Upson board. <laughs> and you said, where I have this hanging in my, in my, in my house, uh, the way the sun strikes this, you can see the lines of the brush lines, the brush lines of, in, coming down from the clouds to the water. You can see the brush lines that are just so, it's just so typical of the right, the right kind of brush stroke made this a, a, a wonderful painting. And in the corner, there is Sam Newton's name. Now, as, as I said before, Harold Newton was, I see, I think one of the best. Sam Newton, his brother, was almost as good. So I'll take it. I got this painting for $9.99. It has been in my house for five or six years now, or no, no, my, more like 10 years. Um, so I'm very happy with it. What I did with, what I did with it before I, um, before I brought it home, as I went to that gallery in Lake Worth, where I originally met Calvin Hare, and I knew, I had interviewed the, the owner of that gallery too, as part of my thesis. I interviewed the gallery owner there because he dealt in a lot of highwayman paintings. And I showed him what I, what I found. And he says, wow, you found that in a Goodwill? I said, yeah, it was not a, not a, I would never go into a Goodwill now without looking at their paintings. But anyway, what he did for me is he cleaned it up and remounted the, um, uh, the hanging on the back for me. And um, he did not authenticate it for me, but I bet if I would ask him to do that, I could have him do that. But with Sam Newton's name on it, I, I don't think there's a reason to do that. When, when I showed a picture of it to Marianne Carroll, and I said, look what I found, and she showed, she looked at it, and she says, yeah, that's, that's definitely Sam's work. So we know it's, it, we know it's his work. So anyway, let's see if there's anything else I haven't told you. Okay. This, to me, finding this painting was sort of like the culmination of the whole trip from uh, talking to Kelvin Hare, talking to the other children of the highwaymen and interviewing the gallery owner and so forth. This was like a seal of approval in a way for me to have done this. So that is it. 
Does anybody have any questions? Well, I don't know about a question. I have a bunch of comments. Um, I have always been attracted to the high women's um, uh, work. I had no idea there were only 26 of them. I assumed it was, you know, some whole bunch or something like that. I didn't realize that they actually work together. And the thing that I have always enjoyed about them is those wildly um, uh, uh, extravagant sunsets, sunrise, whatever they are, yeah. the golds, the, um, uh, the beautiful sense of a, a concentrated color thing. It's, it is so Florida. It's so typical. It's yes. the kind of thing that the photographers for the Palm Beach Daily News like to get every day for their thing about, uh, you know, here's, here's sunrise in Palm Beach on such and such day. Uh, they, they are exuberant. That's the word I like about Yes, them. exuberant, which I think their, their children's paintings don't necessarily have. No, no, no. As you, you spoke about the force for them, for doing them, this was yeah. a way they could make money without having to, <coughs> you know, uh, right. bust their butts going in the factories or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and they, they did, they, they truly developed their art. They, they found their métier. Um, this, this was something that the beautiful, the amount, the, the proportion of sky, um, which was where they could get the greatest amount of color in. Mm -hmm. it, it really, um, it's very affecting. And yeah. it, the, the gallery that you've been talking about, the, specialized in the high women, of course, it's right up the street from me. Mm -hmm. I've passed that so many times. I've seen the things, and I mean, had because the store isn't, the gallery isn't there now, but they were always advertising the work of the high women. Right. Because it was a good thing to draw people in from. Mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. And now, as I, as I uh, said before, when these guys were painting, none of them could have gotten any of their paintings, no matter how well done they were, how well realized, into a gallery. And yeah. now all their paintings are in galleries and their children's paintings are in galleries. So it's just a, just an eye. Well, it's like the great American dream in a way. Yes. Yes. And they, and they were able to, to uh, find their, their niche and go with it. Mm -hmm. I just admire them very much for that. Yes. Um, there was one artist that is not covered in here because he was in jail at the time. Uh, one of the highwaymen is named Al Black and he is, he's very, um, prolific. When he was in jail, he was in jail for something like uh, uh, embezzling or something like that. Not, not a, not a, not, horrible, not a horrible, but he was, had to spend time there. So he spent, he did spend his time very productively. He taught other inmates how to paint and they painted the walls, some of the walls of the jail with murals. He showed them how to do murals and such. So, I mean, you know, even in not so great circumstances, it can be done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm waiting for another inspiration now. This one has run its run its course. And Amy, I did go, David and I did go to that museum in Fort Pierce. It's amazing. The Bach yeah. is mm -hmm. I would like to own more high women paintings, but um if they're nine ninety nine, I can afford it. But I, the the one I showed you, Roy McClendon, cost me three hundred dollars. And uh, if I wanted a Harold Newton, I'd be spending five thousand dollars. So I'll just have to keep looking in the Goodwills and the other thrift stores. So that's it. Thank you for listening. I really Hi, appreciate it. Very interesting. So I have a question, Alyssa. Thank you so much. I, I never even heard of the Highwaymen. And I think I never really appreciated that what a Florida sunset or sunrise, you just kind of think that's what it looks like everywhere. The sun is the sun and everyone sees it. So I guess I never realized that those colors may be and I guess well over the water I know is very unique. But um, I was wondering, you mentioned that you did this th your thesis for your master's. So did what was your master's? Was it art history or what was your master's? No, no, actually it was my master's is in Florida history. Florida oh, here's, history. Yeah, here's, a, here's an interesting little tidbit about that. Uh, whenever you do a thesis or, or a, a dissertation, of course, you have to have a committee. So the people on my committee were, um, of course, the chair of my, the English department, 
um, the chair of the art department, um, a professor in anthropology, and um, Gary Monroe. So um, when I had my defense, Gary wasn't there because he lives up in uh, Daytona. But the other uh, people, the other people on my committee were there. And as I was going into the talking about it and how I put it together and so forth and so on, the woman who is the um, chair of uh, the art department said, well, you, uh, you're calling your, your thesis painting across generations, but you've never taken a painting course from me. And I said, well, it's really not about painting per se, it's about Florida history and it's about how the um, how these artists got their start. It's not exactly about the technique of painting. I thought I made my case, but she would not sign off on it with painting in the title. Wow. So um, I what I did is I used just the subtext. I called it the legacy of the highwaymen. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking mm -hmm. for it in the in the disserta dissertations international dissertations theses international. You won't find it by painting across generations. So that's the, but those are the hoops you have to jump through to get yes. your, your work through the bureaucratic obstacles. <laughs> what didn't they like about painting? Well, she said I'd never taken a painting course. Oh. She looked over all the courses that I had taken of history, English, anthropology, and so forth and so on, but I'd never taken a painting course. So how could I put that in my title? She wouldn't sign off on it. Well, you're not supposed to do original research. The research has to come from the professors. <laughs> well, I was uh, maybe maybe somebody like like her or somebody in her department could get into the techniques. But as you can see, there's no real technique there except lots of sky, a couple of birds, and some palm trees. I mean, there's not too much technique there. Oh, another thing, another thing. Um, Florida Atlantic University owns about 30 Bacchus paintings. Really? Yep, They're, they they line the boardroom. Wow, for heaven's sake. That's neat. Hey, Alyssa, when you mentioned how they do it kind of, you know, factory style, assembly style, some of these big names and the ones for like 5,000, did they do the entire painting or you think they were done like that and they got to put their name on it? I think some of the ones like like Sam Newton and James Gibson, James Gibson just just passed away recently. I don't think they were part of that crowd. I think there is a there's a subset of those 26 who did the assembly line painting, and uh, others like um, McClendon, the the painting I showed you. I don't think he was part of that subset either. But if you look at all, if you had an example from each one of the 26, like if you got Gary Monroe's book. You can see which ones were done by assembly line. You, it would be obvious. But hey, get it done, get it out there, make your money. I know, why not? Another, another tidbit is that the, um, the 26 highwaymen were installed into Florida's Hall of Fame in Tallahassee. So their um, paintings hang in the state houses in Tallahassee. Good. Hmm. When they were doing the assembly, were they trying to make the same painting also, or did they vary, vary their paintings, or were they like kind of just selling kind of like prints in a way? Well, Parisa, I wasn't there, so I don't know for sure. <laughs> I don't know. Like I said, if they were, they were very prolific, and if tourists were taking taking these paintings all over the country, or maybe even overseas, there's ten thousand paintings out there. Some of them might look alike, but who's ever going to have two? To put together, you know, to, to That's check it out. Thinking. Yeah, they probably a lot the same scene. Hmm. Now there might have been something. There might have been some different things. Maybe there were pink clouds in this one, and there were yellow clouds in another. You know, and that well, is. I'll, I'll tell you, I used to sell furniture when I was in high school, or I worked at a furniture store, and everyone would come from up north, and they'd come to our furniture store in Florida, and we'd say, "Which color do you want?" It was yellow, green, white, and they would buy all the the fake bamboo furniture in yellow. And then we'd say, and you get two paintings with this. 
And they were all those mass produced paintings. They all were identical, but no one, no one compared their bedrooms with each other, but Right, right. Funny. Well, here's another another thing. Speaking of furniture and and people's houses, I have a friend who lives down in uh, Lighthouse Lighthouse Point, and um, his his house was designed by an architect and was furnished and uh, outfitted by an interior designer. And um, I noticed when I visited him one time when I was um, there, I went into his into, to use the bathroom. And I noticed there's a high woman painting on the wall huh. right over the toilet. So you took it. <laughs> <laughs> I might have. I might. But anyway, when I come out, I say, wait, wait a minute. You have a high woman painting in your bathroom? And he says, uh, is that what they're called? And I said, yes, those are famous paintings. Why did I say that? I should never have said that. But he says, oh, there's another one in the other bathroom. I said, really? So I went in to say, yes. And now I didn't get close enough to them. There wasn't enough light for me to see whether they were signed, but I was absolutely sure that they were high women paintings. And I said, you have to sell those to me. And <laughs> he said, well, how much are they worth? What could I say? Nine ninety nine. <laughs> I said, if you ever think about selling those paintings, you have to call me first. He said, okay, fine. Okay. So who, now I'm asking, why did they end up in the bathroom? I asked him why they, why did they end up in the bathroom? He says, well, you know, so and so, who was a designer, thought that the colors went well in there. <laughs> Can you believe that? Mm. I mean, yeah, actually, yes, I, I knew some people who had um, studios in uh, Soho in New York, and the big complaint they had was people would come in and they wouldn't look for the paintings for the paintings; they'd look for the colors. Yeah, they look for things that matched their walls. They didn't care if it's actually. I'm going to stop recording at this point, Thank right? Yes, yes, that's fine. <laughs>